More Than Fitness family, I'm your host, Adrian Conway, and I want to again thank you so much for your support and your willingness to tap in and spend time with me as I get an opportunity to spend time with some of these great athletes and, of course, those behind the scenes and involved in the sport of CrossFit. Today, you're going to listen to an interview that I was very blessed to be a part of with Will Morad. Um, to say this dude's an inspiration is to... Um, not quite do him the service that I think he deserves, but uh, at minimum, you're going to be inspired. Um, You'll be entertained uh, as he is a great storyteller. But in this episode, we dive into some of the ups and the downs that he's experienced as a competitive athlete. Will is on the brink of his fifth appearance at the CrossFit Games, and he's been pursuing it since about 2013. That means that Half his years of pursuing, he was successful and about half he wasn't. He shares what those peaks and those valleys have looked like, why some of them were present in his absence from the CrossFit Games, um, and also some of the struggles that he's had throughout the years. We talk about his journey from being at TTT with Max El Hodge and even now uh, with Tia and Shane and the Proven team uh, at Proven there in, in Nashville as a training cadre. Um, you know, he has a very unique story in regards to his own desperation to be great at the sport, where that mindset developed and how he always admired athletes like Michael Jordan, like Tom Brady, like Kobe Bryant, and felt as though he was always so drawn to that, even prior to his pursuit of CrossFit. Candidly ask him, does he believe that is something that can be coached or is it something that you're born with? You guys are going to have to tune in, of course, to hear his answer. Will is even very honest and open about, because of his desperation to the sport, his what seemed to be a a slight perhaps addiction to NSAIDs, where he was very heavily dependent upon Advil in regards to his ability to recover and his ability to show up every day with joint pain and discomfort and continue to perform and hopefully progress. Uh, You may not know this about him, but in 2017, he had what was diagnosed as a very unique uh, kidney uh, issue, right? Where he was essentially what he would share as uh, inappropriately diagnosed. But in 2017, while competing at Wadapalooza, he had a bit of uh, what was categorized as kidney failure. And they believed that it was a very unique uh, disease that he had. And it led him to stepping away from the game, from the sport. Um, due to his health being something that he clearly prioritized, he was willing and at peace to do that, but then was able to find out that he could return in the future. And he did so after some years, getting back to the competition floor, his setbacks and distractions from competing didn't stop there as, uh, he and his wife experienced her, um, being diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and of course, Will is very transparent in sharing uh, the way that they navigated that together, um, the inspiration that she was and continues to be for him as she is now in her mission and recovered from her breast cancer, and how he tries to use these experiences from losing his father at a young age um, to the kidney struggles that he had with his health to his wife's battle for her life and experiencing breast cancer um, as a form of jet fuel. He's very descriptive in how this jet fuel, if you use it, if you dare to use it for motivation, it can do one of two things. It can either burn you out because of its potency, um, or it can be something that launches you forward through a trajectory that's far past where you believe that you could go. Uh, it's very timely and it's important to be sensitive on when it's, it's available to use uh, these emotional ties um, and these strong feelings as motivation in sport and in life. And he shares a little bit about how he's been able to do that. But I apologize for talking your ear off. Clearly there's a lot of meat within this interview. I'll take the back seat. Here is Will Morad. What is up team? And welcome to another episode of more than fitness. I'm Adrian Conway. And today I'm going to be joined by Will Morad, who I'm extremely excited to have here with me uh, on this particular episode. But before we jump in, I want to remind you guys, feel free go back. We've got several episodes now that have launched in our live. Share your favorite episode with your people. Make sure that we're getting this good content out to many others. And of course, if you enjoy this episode or any in the past, be sure to subscribe. And you know what would also help is if you could leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, however you're consuming the content, show us some love and it will help us reach a more broad audience. But this handsome gentleman here, to my right might be your left. I don't know where you're watching this, but this is Will Morad. Will, how you doing this morning, man? I'm good, man. How are you? 
Oh man, I'm I'm on cloud nine as I find myself in preparation <laughs> for um, semifinals, and I'm not competing. You know what I'm saying? I'm just doing the homework. I'm just getting my mind right. I'm just trying to get you know ready to put on a, hopefully a good a good show for the for the listeners and viewers. Just talking about what studs like you are going to be doing on the floor. So I feel good. But the more direct question is, how are you feeling? Yeah, man, I feel really good. I think right right before we hit live, uh, we were chatting about this, and man, I I feel really good for the first time in a long time going into an event. Not to say that I haven't felt awesome all the time, but you know, you're usually carrying some type of something um, this time of year when, when you're training so much. And I'm actually feeling pretty good. So we're a week out, uh, just kind of fine tuning these these events now that they're starting to come out and. I feel good, man. I'm ready to go. I love to hear that, man. Of course, it's encouraging. It's a, it's really a great time of year, um, and it's not always the case to be feeling good. And you alluded to that by saying, like, yo, I don't always feel great, um, but you know that you've attacked it in the right way, and you're hitting that sweet spot in the way that you're controlling your volume, controlling your intensity, and essentially for you, peaking for what's going to be uh, the Northeast semifinal. Um, for us, I'm not sure when our viewers or listeners are going to get an opportunity to listen to this, to this video, um, or, or listen to this podcast episode, but I can say, you know, right now you're sitting at about a week out as you get ready to probably hit your good sharpening slash tapering phase. Um, but that also brings up to me is like, man, you're pursuing what would be your fifth individual appearance at the CrossFit games. And for you, this window of appearances and, and, and getting there to the game's floor has actually spanned over what about 10 years or so, 10 or 11 yeah. years of, of competitive yeah. fitness. So when you think about that in the, in the accumulation of all the workouts and everything that, that you've been able to experience throughout the years, man, um, how, how do you feel about where your career is today as you prepare yourself for year number five? Yeah, that's, that's crazy to think about it like that. I've been doing this thing for a very long time. Uh, yeah, I think it's an evolving process. Uh, this would be my fifth uh, CrossFit Games over the span. I mean, my first regional was 2013. Um, and I've just evolved throughout those years, right? You're young when you get in. You you don't really have a lot of experience. Obviously, the goal is to be the fittest man on the planet and to run around with the fittest dudes in the world on that competition floor in Madison in August. And that's still the fire in me, obviously it was Carson. Now it's Madison. Um, that hasn't changed at all, but the way I go about my business has changed quite a bit. And I've let that <clears throat> I've done it intentionally and unintentionally. You know, I, I think the ups and downs of life and training and being a pro athlete is something that you got to learn how to manage. And I've done a pretty good job of that throughout the years, dealing with just like a lot of different challenges. Uh, personal, professional, physical, emotional, all that stuff. And I'm still rolling and I'm still feeling good. So yeah, week out, I I feel as healthy and as strong as fit as I ever have um, at 33 years old, which is pretty amazing. And um, yeah, I'm excited to get rolling uh, in about a week. <laughs> Yeah. And about a week, man, your, 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 your time window is getting smaller as I hope that your excitement is continuing to rise. Um, yeah. you know, you, you, you alluded to this a little bit, right? There's ups and there's downs. Um, there was a point I think in our sport, uh, where like for me, and, and I'm just, I'm kind of being specific here, but I got to assume that a lot of people felt this way, but you know, when I got my first opportunity at the CrossFit games as an individual, it was like, and before that I was there on a couple years as a team. So for me, once I'm in the flow of this, I was like, yo, if I don't make it to the games, my season is like destroyed, right? Like it was completely pointless. You know what I mean? Like, oh, fruitless pursuit. And, and, and that's very much not true. And of course, as I've matured and understood the sport and see where the competition is continually risen to throughout the years, I have a different perception. Throughout your career, you've been able to nail it and, and kill it a, a year here, then be out a few years, then come back. And then be back. And now, of course, now you're riding this really great consecutive streak. Has there been a change for you mentally, um, physically in your training? Like, is there anything that you could kind of give credit to the fact that, you know, there, there, there was that 2014, you punched your ticket. We didn't really see you back at the competition level at that, at the games until 2019. And mm. now you're rolling. What, what's yeah. the difference both psychologically and from your training? 
Yeah, so that's a long span. I think it might have been the longest span that anybody had had experienced, like a games drought or whatever. Um, but I think as far as keeping the fire and not giving up or whatever that was, like I had ne- a lot of near misses. It's not like, first of all, it was in the hardest mm-hmm. region in the world. Um, I don't like it or like it or not. Like a central was the hardest region in the world. Um, and now we have a ranking system so we can prove it. The, uh, and let, let me just chime in real quick when you say that. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of our, will a lot of our listeners, might not even understand the potent history that exists in the central east in the east in yeah. general now when we when we look at that region and folks when he says the hardest region he don't mean it's close right it ain't even close compared to any other <laughs> yeah. region that previously existed particularly on the male side we'd never seen such yeah. a tight locked competition with uh you know competitors with a pedigree and a history within our sport that that they all carried. Like it was significant amount of weight. So I want to let you continue, but I just need the (laughs) listeners and and, and viewers to understand that when you say that there's no exaggeration whatsoever, there's no even personal uh, preference that you're making when you make that statement, like that's facts all day. Yeah, it's just facts. Um, So yeah, so I, I made it in 14. It was great. I'd been in the sport competitively for about a year. Uh, went to regionals in 13, got 11th, and then finished third in the Central East in 14, made the games, did did the whole thing, made it a career. Um, and then I had a near miss in 15. I finished seventh. I think I was like eighth in the world rankings after that, like across regionals, like didn't go to the games. I was sixth in 16, sixth in the world across regional rankings, didn't make the game. So it's kind of like okay, like he's obviously like games caliber, but the way the sport was at the time, like just didn't pan out. And that is what it is, man. I mean, I've been a a high level athlete my entire life uh, as far as like since I was 16, you know, so in, in soccer. So I kind of get like you win and you lose and it's, that is what it is. But yeah. So, and then 17, I ended up getting diagnosed with a kidney disease and retired me from the sport. Uh, it was called IGA nephropathy. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that story, I'm but not. yeah, I'll be pretty quick with it. But I went to Wadapalooza um, and I had podiumed there the year before, prior and I had a good first event, uh, but was starting to feel kind of sick and then ended up getting sick between events. Um, tried to do the second event of Friday night. I believe it was a Friday night, maybe Thursday night. And was just bombed. And then I woke up that that night night, like maybe Saturday morning at like 2 a.m. And I felt like my body was like on fire. And I was in kidney failure. Um, so we went, my, my wife's a nurse. She said, hey, maybe let's go to the hospital in the morning when like we wake up. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, I'll be good. Ended up like starting to eat my breakfast. And I immediately went to the bathroom and was just like losing my stuff. So... We ended up going to the hospital, got my blood work, all that stuff. And you're like, hey, buddy, like you're in you're in kidney failure. Um, you're not going anywhere for about a week. <laughs> so uh, I ended up having all this testing done because I was this 27 year old stud or whatever, you know, pro athlete and systems were shutting down. And the doctor that took the biopsy of my kidney um, ended up being a bit dogmatic in his diagnosis, but my levels or whatever the pathology said that I might have this thing called IgA nephropathy, which is a progressive kidney disease. And they're like, Hey, you need to change your lifestyle now. So you don't have to get a transplant, yada, 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 as a young man who had just been married and wants a family and wants like a life beyond my athletic career, which to that point had been successful, right? Like relative to the, to the masses. And so I was like, in the hospital room with my wife and my mom had flown down because like her baby boy was like, you know, like, and I was like, I think I'm done. Like, and it was right there. I was like, it's over. And I was at peace with that. Mm. Um, and, and I guess the call, it was an acute kidney injury come to find out I had been like abusing Advil like crazy because the sport hurts and that, that cuts your kidney function tremendously. And then add on, you know, maybe not ideal nutrition, like maybe too high a protein, a little bit dehydrated. And that is the storm, perfect storm for a a kidney injury. And I pretty much did that. (laughs) So luckily I recovered. I spent 
seven, six or seven days in the hospital at Mercy Hospital in Miami. And uh, actually, your last guest, Noah, came and like hung out with me a few days when I was in there. Um, <laughs> kept you, kept your company. He's he's a yeah, good dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great friend of mine. Um, so yeah, I had like friends there that kind of, at least in the initial shock of that moment, to at least give offer some support beyond my family. And uh, so that was cool. But yeah, so I left the sport. And then about 18 months later, I had been in corporate America. I was doing IT sales. I, I had owned a gym. We sold it. Uh, and I jumped right into a, like a consultant position, essentially like a, a junior sales consultant. And was training a little bit here and there just because I'm a lifetime athlete, but nothing like what it takes to be the fittest on earth. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was pretty happy. And I ended up going back, like I said, about 18 months after to my nephrologist. And he was like, Hey man, let's go back and like, look at your pathology report. Let's get all the stuff from the hospital. Like your, your levels are awesome. Like you don't need to be in this place ever. And he ended up saying, Dr. Shonda, shout out, uh, nephrology associates, Nashville. <laughs> um, he was like, I, I don't think you have this disease. And I was like, what, what do you mean, man? <laughs> like I've changed my whole yeah. life. And he's like, dude, you're a healthy guy. And sometimes pathology reports aren't exactly, they don't tell the full story. Um, he's, he was pretty honest in the sense that like, Hey, like, I think that doctor was just trying to look out for your well being as a young man. And, um, th I'm thankful that I had took the time away from the sport because second, essentially my second career in the sport has been much better than my first, uh, as far as like games appearances and stuff. And we'll get to that. But um, yeah, so then it was 2018, uh, like mid, like August, maybe. Um, that I, just, I talked to Max Ahaj, I was working with TTT at the time. And I said, Hey, let's make another run. And then made a run in 19, uh, made it back to the games, finished 10th. And I think that whole process, I said, I'd make it short, but it's hard to make that short. <laughs> um, kind of gave me perspective on what is important in life and and doing things for the right reasons and um enjoying the process and realizing that this is like this life we're living is really a sprint man like it's a short time we're here and enjoy it obviously tick the right boxes to accomplish big goals like going to the crossfit games but i just had a healthier perspective after that um you know health scare and here I am, uh, going going for number five, and couldn't be happier um, with pretty much every everything in life. Like, really, no complaints. It's a it's a hard profession I'm in, and I, I'm loving it, man. So, that was, I think I answered your question. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You did, bro. You did. You did. You're, you're, you're killing it. You're killing it. You because you educated me on something that I I wasn't c completely sure of, um, which was your diagnosis there in 2017 and what took you out of the sport. Um, you know, I, I, it's interesting. You know this this story. Uh, you know, even your 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 verbiage of this dogmatic view that sometimes we can experience within um, any any facet of life, right? We can have a yeah. polarizing perspective that sometimes blinds us to the potential of other issues your physician or the doctor that was seeing you had diagnosed you at the time inaccurately, but he thought he was doing the best to serve you at that time. Right. And I, yeah. and I think it's, it's really cool and really healthy that you've shaped this perception of an experience that a lot of people, man, could view as like, yo, he took away a year and a half of my training life or two years of my competitive career versus you've now allowed to allow that to be, you know, an opportunity for you to see that, you know, you clean some things up, you learn some things about yourself, you were actually at peace if that was going to be the route that you had to take. And I think that's extremely admirable. And, and I really, from, from sitting in this chair as the interviewer, um, I, I can't help but assume, man, that that's actually created some advantages for you as an athlete at this stage in your career. You know, there's many young athletes that their every smile or feeling or sadness airs on how they perform. And yet you're here as an experienced competitor that life has thrown itself at you and you had the sport taken away for a little bit, right? Yeah. You've had, you've had some failures as well in regards to trying to, to perform and be there, but more so like you just understand that it can be fleeting and that you got to enjoy every moment. So I love that you shared that aspect. Now you mentioned something though, that stood out to me, the, the, the Advil thing. 
Um, mm. So you were you you were popping these Advil. I'm assuming a lot like you know sweet tarts. Oh, like yeah. it was candy, probably. Yeah. Tell tell us a little bit about where you were at training wise and what what allowed that to be a manifestation and you trying to feel better and, and perform. Yeah. So I was 20, 27. Um, and I'd had like a history, like little back things. Like I'd had like a lot of disc stuff. I've had to get like epidurals and all that stuff in that, in that period of my time, uh, in CrossFit. Uh, so it was an easy band aid to just be like, Oh, I'll take three or four, whatever the max dose was. Honestly, I've, stopped doing that (laughs) so i can't tell you but i i was taking like the heavy doses and even as a young man who could probably recover quicker uh than like somebody who was unhealthy it was obviously chopping away kidney function i think the thing is like for every advil you take it drops like 10 or 5 percent kidney function just for one um and i was doing that especially in, in a training camp where like volume's high stress is high your kidneys are working harder or just all your organs like your body's just in overdrive um i was just doing that to mask some of the pain in my back so i could get the job done and that's that's kind of like the dark side of sport like it hurts like it's you're you're not like an f1 car where they can just order a new part like it takes time to heal and things like that and if you can just put a band-aid on it like taking seven advil a day like i i did that just to accomplish my goal which in retrospect was a very poor decision but that's the hunger right and when you have this like unsatiable hunger as like a a high level athlete which i think you kind of have to be that way like you said earlier like a little crazy to do this like all of us are to to compete at the highest level and it's it's it was almost a desperation i would say like Mm -hmm. as a young athlete just like um doing whatever it takes to be on that floor to, cause I, it's your heart and your soul and everything. And that, and that hasn't changed. I'm just a little bit more in tune with how to get there in a healthier way. Right. Uh, and that's just, you know, maturing as a man and learning myself and surrounding myself with good people, a gr- great nutritionist coaches who understand this stuff. And obviously I've educated myself as well to, to the 10th degree, right. After going through that, um, and I get regular blood work now, which I encourage everybody to do, especially if you're a professional athlete, um, no matter how old you are, uh, I, I would say every, every three to six months is probably the way to go. If you're going to be a pro- professional athlete, um, share that with your nutritionists and your doctors and make sure you're just a healthy, healthy human. Um, and I've been doing that pretty much on the clock since, uh, and it's keeping me keeping me pretty healthy, right? Like you get a little banged up here and there just from the volume. And, but yeah, I, I don't abuse, uh, incense anymore. <laughs> and I drink a lot of no, water, man. even though I'm yep. caffeinating right now. I dude, I, uh, I quit coffee for a year during that time, which was like, Whoa, <laughs> Whoa. Listen, if you, yeah. look, if you guys are listening to this and now you know how crazy Will is, he gave up coffee for a whole year. <laughs> And if you enjoy coffee the way I enjoy coffee, he's talking, he's talking crazy nonsense here. Yeah, no, I, yeah. you know, I, I, but, but seriously, man, on a more serious note, I think that, um, what you're sharing is completely relatable, um, to people who are pursuing the sport at a high level. You know, I remember I, you know, before finding CrossFit as a competitor, I was a, a division one football player. I played college football at Weber state university and, Toradol injections and cortisol injections were something that yep. floated around our locker room on a regular basis prior to games. I, there were weeks where I took both uh, cortisone injections directly to my ankle where I had a torn ligament and Toradol to my bum. They give you that shot in the bum. And, that, and that's more of like yep. a global anti-inflammatory that helps you perform. So I, I totally understand that. And, you know, unfortunately, there is a cost for that type of treatment. Right. And now we're talking yep. more direct injectables that are very potent. You're talking NSAIDs. The outcome is still, you know, the, the desired outcome is still the same. Right. Um, and well, it's, unfortunately, it's important, I think, to to, to, to like uh, so Toradol is an NSAID. It's just like the daddy end said, um, sure. and then, uh, cortisone is obviously like a corticosteroid and you, and you yep. treat that for like tendonitis or whatever, but that's a little sketchier. Cause you got to get like 
it's not like a banned substance. You have to get like a therapeutic use exemption if you're going to do it off. I just got to cover all my bases because I play by That's the right. rules, right? <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, so like cortisone is definitely, it's not an NSAID and you need to go through the right paths to use it to treat an injury. Yeah, it's, but they're not a, it's a steroid. But they're not performance enhancing drugs. Like, no. Like taking Toradol isn't going to make me a better, it isn't going to make me snatch 500 pounds. It's like. Correct. It's like power Advil, which is bad yeah. for your kidneys. <laughs> right. And, and that's more so what I'm saying, what I'm, what I'm trying to allude to is that for people who are trying to find relief, you know, and, yeah, and I think yeah, that exactly. a, a, a pill can do it or even an injection can do it. Like, yes, it can momentarily, but again, and we're talking band-aids, right. And for you yeah. now at this point in your career, you've, you've had this, you've got this understanding of, man, it's my lifestyle. It's my nutrition. It's the way that I sleep. It's the way that I warm up and cool down. Um, that can really help minimize and mitigate the the same things that you were trying to treat with almost more of a quick fix back in the day, um, exactly. With more of a positive outcome, so I, I love that you're sharing that. I, I think that you know a word that you shared, <laughs> which I use a lot. Um, in fact, it's how I explain to a lot of the clients that I'm willing to work with um, that say they want to be competitive. I use this word and the word is des you said desperation and I use the word desperate, yeah. right? Like when someone comes to me and they're like, Hey coach, um, I want to, I want to make it to the games as a master's athlete, or I want to make it to, uh, the games on a team, or I want to do X, Y, and Z. I want to make it as an individual one day. You know, one of the things that I try to gauge on them is, is their desperation for greatness? Like, are they desperate to make it or do they think they want to make it? And I think that's such a, such a different conversation for people. Right. But will you, you shared that word because of the things that you were doing already, right? The sacrificing of your body, the training, the time you were committing, uh, you wanted to be all in, you wanted to be full time, but you were desperate for what was on the other side of that hard work, which was the achievement of going to the games and being a professional athlete. Um, from a psychological perspective, that desperation for you, was that something that was very natural when you fell in love with the sport? Was it something that grew over time? Have you been this way your whole life? Like what, what yeah. has that commitment level always been there? Yeah, a hundred percent, man. I, I was a soccer player throughout my youth. Um, I played at the collegiate level. I had a little stint in the professional level, uh, my dad played a little professional soccer. My brother was a division one athlete. My sister was a division one athlete. My uncle played in the NFL. Like all my cousins were division one athletes. Like, man, it, it wow. Sport at the highest level was just something that was around me a lot. A, a lot of my friends were division one athletes. Um, a couple, couple guys ended up going pro in like baseball and football and stuff like that. So it's just, been a part of my development as a human and so that's there's something to be said about the the communities you run around in or you grow up with and how they shape you and they say you're so true total of the five people you hang out with the most well, i don't know if that's true but i definitely am very similar to a lot of the people that i've been around with as far as like my athletic achievements and i think there's a common thread amongst high achievers and it is just that obsession and willingness to sacrifice. I'm not going to go out with my friends on a Friday night when I'm a 17 year old high school dude, I'm going to go run. And that's tough. And, uh, it, I've, it's kind of cliche to say, but like <laughs> when I was a little kid, like M Michael Jordan was my, my favorite athlete. My family's from Chicago. Michael Jordan was like, Going like watching the Bulls was like going to church, man. And um, I wrote every book report growing up when I was a little kid. I wrote on Michael Jordan. Like my mom was like, <laughs> "Hey, maybe you need to." And I had it memorized by you know eighth grade or whatever. Like I didn't even have to read the book anymore. But that that said, those things that he speaks about about being a champion, about like it 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 doesn't matter, get the job done, um, or, or even a Kobe quote. I got a Kobe a Kobe book on my kitchen table over there like um you know job's not done like jobs not, like it's that's just kind of how i've always been and i've really looked up to that um i'm not like trying to parallel my careers to those guys because obviously i haven't won a shit mm -mm. but it's the mindset and i just admire it yes and yeah so yeah i think i've been like this my whole life highly competitive i'm the youngest of three so it was like just trying to trying to survive out there with my big brother and his friends and even my sister and her friends. Um, 
because they're just competitive athletes and they bully you. So I think, yeah, it's just shaped me and sport has been formative for me as a human. And I get like some people play sports till middle school, till high school, till even college, if you're lucky. And then if you're a pro, obviously you're in the same boat as me and you you can speak to this with me one-on-one, but um, it's, it, sport has always pulled me in. Like it hasn't been a job. It hasn't been like, Oh, I have to go do this. It was like, no, I, like I need to like sport has pulled me in. Um, and I just get so much from it. Not, not only the competitive, uh, release of just like the physicality of it and the emotions it, it elicits, but uh, everything on the opposite side of that, like the, the, not the experience in life, it's given me the perspective it's given me um, for challenges outside of the arena. So yeah, sports been everything to me, man, uh, for a very long time. And, and it still is like, and I, I spoke about it in the, earlier, but, um, that youthful exuberance, like I still have that fire to, to compete with the best in the world. And that hasn't changed. And, and, and some, and people are, and we can get into this, but like people are like in, Pat Bellner probably is in the same boat with me or even Noah's in his thirties now. It's like, ah, this, there's this preconceived notion that it's like, oh, when you're in your thirties, it's over. And it's like, nah, man. Like, I think people make that decision. Like, Hey, I, I, they want an out. Like people want the easy way out and maybe they're not as crazy as me. Uh, and it's, it's just in me. So that hasn't changed. Um, obviously performance is still high and like, I, sports sports pretty much it's people are like oh you need to have balance and i i don't think i have like i don't not have balance it's just who i am um yep. and my family and friends still love me so that's all that matters <laughs> that, that is all that matters man people people that are close to you will understand you know your your bit of you know i, I and i and i know you alluded to this a little bit earlier but i you know, before we got on and went live, I was like, yo, man, you know, we might talk about when your when your CrossFit journey started and when you found out that you were psycho like the rest of us, like, you know, <laughs> and I said that jokingly, but also to understand, and you mentioned this, that there there's a very unique psychology for that that, that CrossFit tends to really draw in or, or especially the high achievers within our sport out of. I can't say that yeah. the everyday CrossFitter listening to this will always relate to the way that we're drawn to training. In fact, many of them might be trying to navigate navigate obstacles. And I really don't want to go to the gym. Right. And I really yeah. don't want to eat, eat well. And for us, because of sport, and I literally just talked about this last night, man, I'm, I'm a pretty spiritual dude, Will. So like I lead a small group, um, as a part of my church. And I was actually explaining how so much of the things that I've chosen from sport, like my, my hard work and my commitment to doing things that other people weren't doing, or my commitment to nutrition helped me so much from a spiritual perspective, because it's like, in, it's like embedded these habits in me that I see translate into being a father or a husband or also even in my spiritual walk, like, Hey, I don't want to read. Okay. Yet, yeah, Well, I know that I don't want to, but I know what it will do for me if I do. And then all of a sudden, because I read, then I want to pray. And when I pray, then I can lead and then I can serve. And I, I'm just a different human. Mm-hmm. Right. And, yeah. and it helps me the same way in all these other relationships. Um, but, but I just, I, I always love this conversation because you say that, man, this was ingrained in you from a very young age. And it seems as though, right. It seems as though I'm not, I'm not, I'm not everybody listening and watching this. Don't, don't hold me 100% <laughs> true to this. I got no studies. I got no facts but it seems like this is something that's unteachable. Do you think it's teachable or do you think you're born with this bent, bent or weird, you know, psychology? Yeah. Uh, you mean born with the the drive to the drive about being like a professional athlete? I think some people are born with genetic potential, but the mentality, um, that's what I mean. I think the mentality. Yeah. It's hard for me to speak to because I it's just been the way that I've been and I don't know if that's because if it was learned from an early age just from like my my childhood and being around my parents who nurtured my athletic aspirations and my brother and sister who pushed me and who obviously were successful in their athletic pursuits and even my friends or even like where I was born on the planet and like surrounded by these great athletes like there's so many things to consider when it comes to like what shaped me and how did it help uh 
like form this competitive mindset to to just do it over and over and over for you know a long decades now and i think yeah i don't know if you're born with it it's been something that i've actively like tried to get better at um i don't mm -hmm. think it's like I, i've always like my, mentally tough all that stuff like that that was always a dr i was always drawn to that growing up like what yeah. does that mean like what wh what makes these athletes so good and i would even listen um and i still do like interviews of my favorite athletes or like the championship interviews they were like michael jordan does interview or steph curry um or tom brady and they're they're doing an interview after a championship and i don't know i just kind of like studied their mannerisms and how they they went about it because even if I don't reach the pinnacle of my sport, I can aspire to be like these people. And Absolutely. even if you get just as close as you possibly can, that's better than not at all, right? Because if you're getting close, if you're get, if you're on the same mountain, that's pretty damn good, right? So I think, uh, yeah, I've just I I really enjoy the athlete mindset, and I I really look up to people that have achieved the most in sport um i'm not like and that's just where i where i live sport so and obviously like i train with the goat every day and i've learned a lot from t um so that's a blessing and obviously like shano too helping yep. guide that journey so i it's it's just been good for me to like create friendships with them and and everybody else in the training camp as well, but just to learn from people that are high, high, the highest achievers in a discipline. And that's just something, I just have so much respect for that. Um, I think yeah, I went no, off track. But. No, 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 you're money. <laughs> Listen, you are money because this is exactly where I wanted to navigate next a bit is that you, you know, you, you shared with us that you're, you're draining your, your initial competitive journey started with Max El Hajj down at TTT, right? Very yeah. well known across the sport, still continues to train some of the highest achievers within our sport and space. You yep. punch your ticket back to the CrossFit Games uh, under the tutelage of Max at TTT, but then also uh, make the intentional decision to transition to Proven with the yeah. GOAT, Tia Claire Toomey, with Shane yeah. um, and the crew there. What brought that choice, uh, you know, or what made that choice one that you thought was relevant enough to make the transition and, you know, make the plunge in, in switching camps? Yeah. So in 2020 COVID, uh, COVID games, Brooke Wells had moved to town. Uh, her and her sister moved to Nashville. I guess they just like the city. I don't really exactly know why they moved here, but they moved here and B hit me up and was like, Hey, we didn't know each other at all. She's like, hey, I'm moving to Nashville. Like, you're a games athlete. You want to train? And I was like, yeah, for sure. Like, this is where I train. Come on. So I ended up doing, and our season got canceled. So I ended right. up doing her, this was right after Rogue. So we had like the online Rogue, but that wasn't like a qualifier or anything. It was like the last event of the year for us. And she moved shortly after that, I believe. And then, so I was like, ah, Max, like, I'll just train with B. It's a cool environment. Like, uh, I'll do games prep with her. She was with Bergeron at the time. So for me as an athlete, I was like, ah, let's just like see how other people prepare for the world champs. Like it's, it's a learning, like you try to grab from, like he's coached games champions before. Great. Like let's grab what he's teaching. I got Absolutely. what Max is teaching. Like, so I just did the, her whole camp with her and we had like a really good, um, just like a good training vibe. And then street Horner and Alex Smith came down as well and started uh, training with us and that was just like a really competitive fun group of people and we were all friends and we pushed each other and it was it was a healthy environment <clears throat> so right after that b was like hey i think like i'm thinking about leaving bergeron and t and shane are thinking about moving to nashville and i had gotten to know t and shane during that game prep because they were coming to to Nashville to like just hang out with beer, do like some photo shoots or whatever it was. So I'd ended up like hanging out with them every few weeks um, and enjoyed them. Right. Yeah. Just cause they're kind of peers in the space and it's, it can be isolating being a games athlete. Right. Cause you're kind of by yourself. At least for me, I had been training solo. I've had training partners, but no other games athletes to that point. So I really enjoyed that. So when push came to shove, 
I was like, man, I guess like Alex coming, Streets coming. Um, John Colty ended up moving to town, who was a games athlete in 18. Yep. One of my buddies actually just moved to Nolansville. Saxon moved to Nolansville too. So they're all, they're all coming to live in my city. <laughs> it's like a suburb. But, and then uh, obviously B was there. So we we're like, hey, this could be pretty cool to have six games athletes or whatever training together day in and day out under the tutelage of Shane, which there was always an allure of like, what's he doing? What's he doing? Um, from the outside looking in now I'm in and you know, it's nice. And like, it, it's, I, I've learned a lot from Shane out throughout the past three years now. Uh, but yeah. So then I, I, I told, I, I talked to Max and we just, it maybe wasn't the best breakup at the time because we were really good friends. We're one of my best friends in the world. And, I was just kind of like, hey, I'm thinking I'm going to take my career a different direction. It was nothing personal. It wasn't like I hadn't gained a ton from him. And it wasn't, it was more of like, damn, like your boy's leaving you. And like, it, it, it wasn't the best and now we're cool. But obviously it's a tough situation. It, it's like any pro athlete leaving a, leaving a team under good circumstances. I don't, I don't know, but like when KD left the Warriors, they were winning, they were doing all this stuff. And then like he left and I don't, obviously it could have been other stuff, but it wasn't like we weren't in a good spot. And I just kind of left because I thought that was the direction my career needed to go at the time to have a training camp and have in-person coaching and things like that. So uh, it's all good now. Um, don't need anybody to like say anything. <laughs> it's all cool. But the, uh, yeah, the, the proving camp has been great and it's evolved a lot from 2021 to now. Obviously, the brand has grown a lot. Uh, athletes have come and gone and like I guess me and B and T are like the OGs and then T took this season off. So me and B are the last standing. <laughs> we're, we're the last ones on the proven run. So we're going to keep it rolling for a few more years as far as game stuff goes. But yeah, it's proven has been great. Uh, they, they brought in... Um, uh Dwight and Nick as coaches for the first year and now Nick has taken over as CEO and Dwight's uh still athlete facing like coaching us every day in person um and then Shano's obviously there too so the proven crew is great it's growing it's evolving um which is something that I enjoy like you got you got to evolve every year if you every want to year. Keep, keep going in sport, you need to evolve. You can't just keep the same processes in place and expect to get the same results. Um, and that's an ego check sometimes, but it's true. And it, it helps you get to keep reaching those heights. So yeah, proven has been great, man. That's awesome, dude. And I, and I, and I appreciate you even, you know, bringing to the light that, Hey, it's always an evolution process. And, you know, I can't, I can't think evolution in, in our sport other than acknowledging a little bit of the change of hands of the head of programming, right? We got the, yeah. we got the cause you've been in the game like me for a minute and oh, yeah. it's, uh, been around. We, we got these polarizing, uh, almost differences in a way where we see this handoff of, of testing from Dave Castro to Adrian Bosman, um, with, with like traditional bouts of crossfit no doubt about it but then there's like this touch of new flavor right it's like he's he's dabbing yeah. he's dabbling that 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 adrian bosman to it which yeah. is which is a beautiful thing what are your thoughts on um how the tests have evolved over the last year and a half and how has that kind of changed or evolved your own personal training yeah i at, at the end of the day we got to do what's on the board right and I think it's, I think we can get really into the weeds on this. I think it's fine. Um, just like to, to su summarize it all, I think it's fine. Um, I, my training has, I've put in more skill stuff. Like I've mm -hmm. put in a little bit more time designated for uh, like gymnastic skill work or, or jump rope skill work now, as opposed to in the past, that wasn't always such a highlight. Um, that's not good or bad it just is what it is it's not like it's changing my squat cycle routine or like my my uh echo bike progressions or whatever you know like that's still there it's just different elements and it's it causes you to be a little bit more creative mm -hmm. uh with how you go about your training i think you can it's a it's a slippery slope like you could maybe get too cute with programming sometimes and i don't sure. think we've gotten there yet uh 
I think I, I would like to think that the people writing the programming are aware that that's a risk and uh, and they can't forget that this is an entertainment business as well. <laughs> like, come on, man. Absolutely. We need you know the, we need saying? we need the people watching us. Absolutely. Yeah. So, like, don't make things mind numbing or. There's a there's ways to do it the a, a right way as far as evolving the athletes and pushing the limits of who the fittest on earth are. And um, I think they're still doing that now. Are all the games or regionals or open or quarterfinal workouts perfectly programmed? And is the balance of what they're testing and how they're testing it perfect? No, the answer is no. And, and I think that's because it can never be yes, because it depends on who answers that question. Totally. It's such, you know, it's a very gray area. I think there are some ways to test fitness and cover a lot of the bases in a more regimented way and mm -hmm. less amb ambiguity in what we're actually doing. But mm -hmm. Uh, CrossFit is sometimes just the king of ambiguity. So like, that's the sport we signed up for. And I think it is what it is, man. I, I like to think, and I haven't spoken with Boz about this at all. And, um, but I like to think like, even if he did write a workout and it was like, ah, like he'd learn from it and change it and like keep rolling with the punches. Um, but we'll see what comes out. I, I like the, the regional events so far. Like yeah. they, they seem cool double run i got a scent they haven't briefed the workouts obviously or put uh anything out there but i think the we're doing an air runner on the first event and then uh i think the snatch event they're gonna make us do like a shuttle run or something you know what i'm saying just like the shoulder overhead but like how do you do an 800 meter shuttle run on a 50 on like a little i don't know but that's my guess i think two runs is cool like the first time that's been done i think at a semi is a double run i agree yeah. So like, yeah, I think, I think so. Whatever. I think it might be, it might be the first time it's double run. Um, but you know, Hey, we see it a lot at the games, right? We're running in different, exactly. all kinds of different forms at the CrossFit games. We are humans. We are bipedal. We do need to get ourselves from point <laughs> yeah. A to point B. Um, clearly Boz was a fan of riding the ship in regards to running throughout the season so far to this point, because oh, yeah. we, we see them shuttle runs in every aspect, exactly. which is, which is cool. And I, and I think even me now, you know, I'm learning something from him um, because he's, he's an OG before we're OGs even. Right. Oh, yeah. So it's Big like, time. if there's a balance here, uh, it might all not take place in 2022 and 2023, but it might be like this balancing of like, Hey, we were really far left and now we need to become more right. And of course to get us more right, we got to kind of lean a little bit harder this way. And then once we're back in the middle, we'll start to kind of see this beautiful, you know, what we think in our minds. Cause we're always just personally justifying our, our, our judgment. Totally. Right. Um, yeah. but, the, but that, but that balanced approach, but yeah, I've loved it so far, man. I, I think your perspective is a healthy one too. Everybody yeah. notices a shift and we got to adapt to it. And, I hope that for all athletes, we all just humble ourselves and say, yo, whatever's out there, I'll be ready for it. And I'm just doing my best to get prepared. Um, man, I, well, I, I love the, I love, you know, the, the flow of this conversation. And, and I think, you know, the next topic that I kind of want to dive into is that you go to proven you're, you're in a place where, um, you're thriving and you're successful. Um, 2021, I believe you wrap your CrossFit games experience and then, your life is flipped upside down again with health issues within your family. As, as most people will know, um, your wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And yeah. so it's kind of like, again, you know, we're, we're exploring these, these, uh, what we all go through uh, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. And you've already dealt with your own personal health, uh, limitations or, or, or balances slash compromises from within competing in the sport. But now, you know, your wife's the one kind of facing, um, an, an illness that is a pretty darn scary one, man. Can you explain a little bit what that process was like as you wrap 2021 CrossFit games individually? And then, you know, you got an even bigger test now looming on the backside of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we finished the games. It's this huge, like release of just eight months of pretty much i call it like monk life <laughs> you know you're dialed Seriously. in it's stressful you're pushing your limit to the app you're pushing your body to the absolute limit emotionally and um yeah so like i guess right before the games my wife had felt like a lump or something and she didn't tell me 
uh, this was like, I think maybe at the games, like she had felt this and obviously she's not going to tell me this, like right in the moment. She's this, like my high school sweetheart. It's, she's been around me as an athlete. I think she gets the, ath like, she knows it. She was like, I'm not going to mess with him until after this week, which is crazy. Like she's a beast. Um, crazy. And yeah, like, she's like, Hey, keep this, like I can deal with my stuff after. So anyways, we get home and she's like hey i have this thing i'm gonna go in and get it checked and i'm like all right so she goes she gets uh an ultrasound and i believe a, a biopsy it's a it's a like a whirlwind right now like i i, I almost like it's so much to like compartmentalize it and pull it out like as far as the order but uh yeah so she she gets all the the testing done and then maybe a week or two later we go in and meet with the oncologist and they're like yeah man you got you have breast cancer and she's like <laughs> young young woman you know yep. 30 years old and uh that kind of like life stops and you're kind of like what do you mean like we were about to like start trying to have kids and like you know you just made the world championships and she's been successful at her job and you know we have like this nice beautiful house and a dog and all this stuff and like this happened and we 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 kind of got right into it i think like she it's something that i'd done like kind of dealing with my stuff but she did exactly the same way as like i kind of dealt with the the kidney thing like he, she was like all right we'll get on with it like we'll get the treatment done we'll do all the stuff we'll turn all the we'll do we'll flip all the switches we need to to hopefully get through this as quickly and as you know harmlessly as we can and luckily we have this great health professionals in nashville and started her treatment plan and the past look well, over a year it was it was pretty challenging man you know like i almost took the year off like it was just a lot of emotional stuff to deal with and being a pro athlete is very selfish innately like yeah she cooks for me she does a lot of, like my laundry like she like our life is kind of shaped around my career because it is so consuming it's like vacations all this stuff we can't do things because of like my schedule my training schedule and stuff like that so it was almost like it gave me perspective like damn dude like this is real life and now it's about her and getting her healthy and she insisted like no you got to keep doing your thing like let's keep life as normal as possible and as you can like it things change and like seeing the, your loved ones just in that way i don't know if you've been around people like that have experienced chemo and yeah um all the treatment the surgeries and the like the emotional strain that that has and it's just really heavy, man. And I, I remember going into the uh, like the chemo area with her the first day. And I think I don't know, it's like chemo ward or whatever it is. But I went in there with her because it was COVID. So like I could only go to one. I went to two chemo things with her. Oh, wow. With all of her treatments because like they said, no, no. So I went to her first one and then I went to her last one and I dropped her off for most of them. Uh, so like I was there, but it's like, can't go in. And those places, man, they give you a real perspective like this. I, I, it's kind of dark to say, but I like told some of my friends, I'm like, man, I think people should like go and ex like go into those places and just like feel that because it, it gives you so much appreciation for your health. Um, I think for the people in there, there's some type of, even though there's not a lot of chatting going on in those places, you know, they're just quiet kind of but there's some type of community there i think that you're not alone and i i don't know i just had like a i wrote like a long thing when i was sitting in there just like observing and maybe like working through my own emotions of the space because we were like some of the younger ones in there you know what i mean yep. and it was it was reminiscent of me going to like the kidney like the nephrology place like there's no young people in there and if it is another young person like they're sick sick and same there like Cass was obviously like maybe one of the youngest ones in there um at least the ward we were in and uh yeah so we it was it was a challenging year and seeing her like just take it in stride was 
like it's it's pretty amazing man like i don't know i'm i was i'm we're lucky that i'm lucky that she is the way she is yeah. as far as dealing with things like that cuz there's a lot of loaded stuff like having a family you're young like all these things that people like people are like oh cancer she had cancer she survived great but like there's a lot of other stuff like that that affects and the emotional toll that that takes and she's just rock solid man so she's good now um it was obviously like a tough year training wise like i i like to think and i'm kind of jumping all over the place but that's just the way this is we're, uh, with, you. we're with you man the uh I- emotional things like this and very powerful experiences in life it's And I've had a few, like I lost my dad when I was young. I had the Mm. kidney thing. Like that is like jet fuel. If you use it the right way to spur you on to try and achieve hard things, but it is jet fuel and you can't use it all the time. You got to learn how to like, just slowly let that emotion out to fuel good performance because it can be, it can be, it can set you on fire and it can burn you out. And So it, I've fortunately and unfortunately with just like all the stuff I've had to deal with, I, I had a okay time trying to disperse that energy and stay focused in the gym, mo- mostly because she was like, you need to keep doing your thing. Like she <laughs> more or less was like, my expectations is that you're going back to the CrossFit games. So like, I'm dealing with some real stuff. You got to figure your stuff out, buddy. <laughs> so she, uh, it was a motivation in that sense. And even like the, this, like the hard times, like driving into the gym, like your mind just takes you some sad places, man, when you're dealing with that as a young man and or, or young woman, whoever, when you're, when your spouse is dealing with like cancer diagnosis and treatment. And it was a, yeah, it was a tough year, dude. It was a tough year and ended up somehow making it back to the games with, you know, I didn't have my best weekend and obviously like training leading up to that point was hit or miss. And, um, but it was a really special moment for us to share throughout that, like in that little time in our life that we'll never forget like that. How can you ever forget like something that's so shaping of you? Like she, we had to deal with something as young people that most people I hope that they don't have to deal with yeah. and um you know you support each other and you grow stronger from that type of stuff like it's so that's the type of stuff that like just creates bonds that are like per, and perspective that you're just like man it can it, it helps harden you I'm not gonna say like you're ever bulletproof but it's like you're galvanized a little bit or whatever the the word would be. Um, But it's kind of like that, uh, that evolve, like you got to evolve. We spoke, we've been speaking about this word. It's a common thing that we've been speaking about evolve with whatever challenges. And obviously it's, you can't just say that about something. It's not like a frivolous thing. Like you just say, like, it's a real thing. And um, yeah, like last year was tough and I, I don't wish that on anybody, but I think, we made the most of it and I wouldn't say like, I would definitely would have preferred to not do that, yes. <laughs> but we learned a lot from it and here we are, man. Like we're, we're on the other side of it. She's healthy. Um, and yeah, yeah. We're yeah man. That now. And, and I appreciate you sharing all that. I think that like you shared, there's an honesty that exists. Hey, no one wants to go through that. Um, No one actually anticipates going through something like that. But, you know, when we get an opportunity to listen to athletes like yourself, humans like yourself, share a story and what what Cass battled through and equally you were there with her um, battling through it all the same. uh, I think it it lends itself as like an inspiration to everybody else. Right. And it's also kind of like a gut check, too. Um, there are a lot of folks living their life currently that might be on cloud nine that might be, you know, um, soaring on, on many different highs, right. Or at a peak versus a Valley. And it can just be a reminder to them. Well, you know, when, when, when the days are sunny, soak it up, right. Mm -hmm. Because not every day is a sunny day. Uh, but, but a lot like you, we can make it through the other side. Um, shout out to 
Cass Morad. She's clearly a trooper <laughs> and an inspiration to everybody. It's so Absolutely. cool that, that she encouraged you to continue to compete and pursue the CrossFit Games, not just for you, but also, I mean, I'd have to imagine that if we had her on here uh, for an episode that she would admit that it also maybe gave her something outside of herself to continue to focus on and support. Um, while at that time of her life, it was so easy for her to only be concerned with her health and the things that were going on and the things that she was facing. So it's, it's, it's awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. And I, and I know yeah. for a fact, man, that, and I can't really imagine um, the closeness and the bond that's created through an experience like that in life. Um, Heck, I'd say the closest thing my wife and I have gone through right now is like we've got two kids. So it's like the laboring and delivery room, right? Yeah, that's a whole other level. I don't even know, man. (laughs) Hey, don't worry. I'm, I'm, you know, if you guys are are pursuing that yourselves one day, it'll be there. But it's like, man, um, yeah, it's both are very different. But both are like create that bond again, where you and your you and your partner are significant other get a get a chance to grind through it. But, dude, there's there's so much that I could talk to you about. Um, I, I'd love to have you back on for another episode. Maybe we'll catch up. Uh, yeah. you know, at a, at a later time when uh, when when you're when you're already on 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 in route um to uh this fifth this fifth game's appearance or, or maybe right. maybe even after it maybe we'll catch up after it and see how things <laughs> shake out and how things play out and everything but before i let you go i got i got a final few questions that i like to send everybody off with um so i'm gonna start throwing those at you here man question one is what was your most memorable uh open workout that you've ever experienced and why open workout the Ooh. open man there's been so many open workouts uh uh, maybe my first open workout. Let's do that. 2013. Um, this is before I was really like even in the game. I I was actually in the Cayman Islands at the front end of the open. Like I didn't, that's how like not important it was to me at the time. And it was the snatch burpee, like the 40, 40. And I practiced it on our little porch, I brought a sandbag, like an empty sandbag that you like had handles on it so I could train. So I was a little crazy. You were, uh, you were already a little crazy. Yeah. So like I actually practiced that workout on our porch with a sandbag and then came home um, to CrossFit Town at the time down in Franklin, Tennessee and did the workout. So maybe that's my most memorable. Like you got to go with the first dose. Uh, so yeah, practice it with a sandbag and then did it on game day with the barbell. Um, so yeah, 13.1. So, so my question to you about that open workout is, did you do your burpees to a metronome? Did you like pace oh, your burpees? Man. Out of the, Cause people were busting out all the tricks that year. Yeah. So no, I did not. But my, one of my training partners at the time, and then uh, actually a guy I owned my, my gym with Ryan Fowler played in the NFL for many years. Uh, he was very, very much like that. And he had the metronome going. You can imagine he was a linebacker, 260, 6'5", like doing metronome burpees. Yeah. So, but he, he did do that. And funny story, so we retested that after the regional that year in 13. And he was like trying to like teach me how to pace, which like <laughs> maybe he was on to something. And we retested that workout and I did much, much better on a metronome. Mm-hmm. So there mm-hmm. you go. <laughs> I'm really like pulling stuff out that I haven't thought about in 10 years, but yeah, that, uh, I, I have done a metronome workout. I even, I've even done like the running metronome stuff. Hey uh, man, you got, you got to do it, right? You got to pull out yeah. all the stops. You're, yeah, you you're, listen, all. you're a pro man. You got to be willing to try it all and explore. And I think, uh, you exactly. know, that particularly for our sport, you already mentioned the ambiguity that exists, right. And, and the unknown and unknowable. And it's like, yo, if we're not experimenting, uh, with some things that even seem foolish at the time, then we're probably not as deep in our bag as we think we we are, right? Like, because there's totally. so many different things that you can learn. So, all right, question two, uh, what's your most memorable competitive moment overall? So this could be from the games, this could be a, a regionals experience, or this could be the open or local throwdown, anything. Most memorable, man. Uh, probably one of the games qualifying. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a good one and a bad one. Um I guess the good one would be like making the games last year uh, in the lane right in front of my wife when I was down by 80 points or whatever. Um, that's got to be. That's powerful. Uh, that was just like, yeah, that's definitely the best one um, or one of the best ones. 
just because I was there and like everything that was going on in my life. And then uh, I think the worst one was probably tearing my hamstrings at the games in 19 when I thought I was poised to be on the podium. I think I was in like third place before that happened. Um, and then like the way the programming laid out, like it would have been a really strong weekend for me. So that was probably the worst <laughs> games yeah. memory, but that's sport, man. Like sport is vicious. It is such a vicious, vicious profession. And you know, the scoreboard doesn't care if you have a torn hamstring or whatever it is. So, uh, yeah, obviously making the games last year uh, and everything with that and then the the injury in 19. Hey, those are good. Two polarizing responses. I like it. Number three, um, if you're a music guy or if you're not, what is most likely playing over the speakers if you get to DJ the training session, man? Oh, man. Well, I typically uh, – I've been they've been giving me the tools a little bit more lately. <laughs> I like I I like Drake I like Lil Wayne I like Fifty Cent like oh like how what are you 36? 30? 37. 37. 37. like our era like Carter yeah. two uh, what was Fifty Cent maybe the Massacre uh, oh, yeah. like all the old uh, Drake stuff I like that it just keeps me in the in the zone. Um, yeah, probably those. And, that, and that's like everybody who trains with me like, oh, Will's playing these old guys. <laughs> I, yeah, some of the some of the youth yeah. coming up on the on the rise, they they're not going to understand. They're nah. they're listening to a whole different whole different type of rap and hip hop, that's for sure. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, man, this one's a little bit of a deeper response, but what type of impact would you hope to leave on the CrossFit community? Um yeah, it'd be interesting. I'd like to hear like what my peers would have to say about that. Uh, it's hard to like speak to yourself on that. Like some of like my boys that I've like been pros with for a long time, like Travis, yeah. Noah, Chandler, even like my training partners, like yeah. Brooke. Well, don't Saxon, worry. I'm trying to get. Uh, I'm trying to get them all on the show. So we'll hopefully. Yeah, get yeah. Answer, I don't. Too, you know. I don't know. I, I think that I from a from a pro to pro standpoint that I would mm -hmm. uh, influence other pros to just uh like my professionalism and the way i go about my business and the way i deal with challenges and um maybe like the balance of intensity and perspective and putting those together uh day to day and in competitions and then for the greater crossfit community um i th i think it would have to be more of like an inspiration type of thing like whatever challenges face you in life, like you can kind of make the decision to hit them full on if you're able and see what happens. So yeah, just kind of, I guess, inspire people to, to like transcend whatever moment is challenging them to, to make it something better, or at least see what happens if you, if you try. So yeah, maybe that. I like it, man. I like it. Um, final question. If there's anyone in your life that sees what you do as a pro CrossFitter, and they might have the assumption that this is just what CrossFit is. And of course, it's difficult for them to draw parallels from them to you. What do you have to say to someone that would encourage them to at least take the chance on CrossFit as a methodology or step and foot into a CrossFit affiliate if they've got hesitations or reservations? Yeah, I think it's, it's exercise, right? Like who doesn't, feel better after working out and like mm. if it's a crossfit workout or if it's anything like go for a run and do some push-ups who doesn't feel better after that like the beer tell me the beers don't taste better after you've worked out or or they, or they the, do the nachos, they taste better folks yeah or like even just the after like you go out for an afternoon run and you come in you're hanging out with your friends there's an endorphin thing there um so i think it's just e exercise and obviously I'm on the hard end of this spectrum. Like exercise makes me a, a better person. Um, and I like to think that that is a universal experience. So yeah, just give it a try. It doesn't, that doesn't have to be like the hardest workout ever, right? CrossFit is completely scalable. And it, it, I could literally walk across the yard 10 times and do some air squats. And that could be considered a CrossFit workout, you know, depending on your level and you're going to feel better after it. So why not do something that's good for you physically and mentally? Hey, 
I love it. Great answer. Great response. Dude, I appreciate your time. This has been a great yeah, opportunity it. to sit down, get to know you better. Um, hopefully share your story and your career with the community a bit. Um, we'll do it again in the future in some capacity, I hope. Uh, but yep. thanks again, Will. Everybody that tuned in and listened to the show, thanks for joining us. And um, we will see you next time. Thanks, man.